Catherine arrived in Switzerland from Ohio in 2007 as a tourist, but didn't need a bank account until she returned a year later as an au pair. I had gone to, I think it was UBS at the first time, and they had said that they didn't offer any bank accounts to Americans who had less than $250,000. My boyfriend at the time and I just laughed at that, like... She has to have a bank account. You know, she's going to be living here. After the laughs, Catherine visited other banks. Just as the financial crisis was gaining steam, the Zurich Cantonal Bank said they would give her an account, even though she was American, only after she showed her residence permit. She tried UBS once more. I actually, funnily enough, ended up getting my accounts with UBS, with their UBS Young account at the time. And at that time... I wasn't really planning for any future in Switzerland. I was just there, like, enjoying my time and just wanted to have a place to put my my savings into. Catherine asked that only her first name be used because she is again in a precarious financial situation. Her boyfriend is now her Swiss husband, and she is now a professional with her own graphic design work in the Zurich region, and they have new financial needs, like a mortgage. We got so far along in the mortgage process that people were telling us it was a good idea to buy, and then it was only literally right before we were going to sign the contract that we were finding out, wait a minute, she's American, this is a red flag, this is a problem. My husband was actually abroad at the time in Singapore, and I was here trying to call banks in German, trying to figure out, do you still work with Americans? After 15 or 20 banks, Catherine says five to seven said her nationality would not prevent a potential deal. But that it is even an issue shows how Swiss banks and insurers have reacted to American efforts to nab tax evaders. I'm being told, you know, on an almost daily basis in, in Switzerland and, and in other places around the world, um, one of is we've gotten a letter and told us that we need to close our account. We've heard other stories where we've been told we'll be allowed to leave our assets, but we can't add any new assets. David Kinsey is founding partner at Toon Financial Advisors, an American company in Madison, Wisconsin, serving Americans abroad. I've heard stories where on the client withdrawing money, to doing a transfer, was told, oh, your movement of money prompted us to do a review of your account, and we realize you're an American, and uh, we want you to leave. So it, it seems to be very haphazard. Kinsey attributes much of the pressure to a piece of U.S. legislation called FATCA, or the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. It essentially requires automatic data exchange from foreign banks if they want to have American clients. Kinsey has called this evidence of imperial overreach. To go around and use the weight of your financial and political power to enforce in an extraterritorial way that banks around the world to act as tax agents for the U.S. government is preposterous. Banks have becoming uh, increasingly aware of the fact that having U.S. clients often means to be in non-compliance with U.S. regulation, and banks are becoming increasingly uh, risk averse in that sense. Manuel Aman is professor of finance at the University of St. Gallen. He's also director of the Swiss Institute of Banking and Finance. He says the easiest way for banks to stay legal when it comes to American clients is to open a division regulated by the American Securities and Exchange Commission. For most Swiss banks, uh, with the exception of the large banks, banks and perhaps a handful of specialized Swiss banks, this is simply not worthwhile because they have only a few American clients. And for those few clients, going through all the regulatory requirements for an SEC regulation does economically not make sense. And therefore, they are uh, requiring those American clients to leave the bank. Aman stresses that the accounts most affected here are not standard retail accounts, but rather investment accounts. Swiss banks are either famous or infamous, depending on your view. They are either pillars of stability and secrecy. What Swiss banks still have, and some other global banks wish they had, is uh, clearly their private banking business. Or havens for tax dodgers and bank clients wishing to remain unknown. I think it's yet another ploy to protect banking secrecy. Whether these perspectives are so cut and dried is probably unknowable, but what is certain for the 
the financial powerhouse of Swiss banking is that changes are coming. We are in a, in a time of change right now, but I wouldn't bet anything on a certain direction. I'm Tony Ganser in Zurich, and in this special report, we will hear perspectives from experts and officials on how Swiss banks of the past will not exist in the future. The stone headquarters of Switzerland's biggest banks, UBS and Credit Suisse, here in Zurich Center, don't let on to what is happening to the organizations inside. The global financial crisis of 2008 led UBS to be bailed out and policymakers to grasp to solve the problem of banks too big to fail. Increased pressure from the United States has forced banks to hand over client data of alleged tax cheats or be subjected to the long arm of American justice. And equal attention from cash-hungry European neighbors has eroded Switzerland's famed secrecy to a shadow of its former self. But what do these things mean for the Swiss bank of the future? Quite honestly, no one really knows. And it's not easy to say Swiss banks will go in a certain direction. I'm, I'm pretty sure even Swiss banks do not really know it. Peter Kunz is professor of business law at the University of Bern. Right now, most of them try just to survive, being it in Switzerland as such, or being it abroad. So we are in a, in a time of change right now, but I wouldn't bet anything on a certain direction. What's the strength of Swiss banking? Was it the banking secrecy or was it Switzerland's stability, would you say? I would say the banking secrecy is undoubtedly one of the biggest assets Switzerland had. Of course, no one really can say how many billions of dollars or German Deutschmark to the euros came to Switzerland for, for this protection aspect. But it was at least a big issue. Uh, on the other side, I'm pretty sure that the political stability, we have peace in Switzerland, we have a strong currency, are also additional assets of our country. Uh, these assets, I think, must be strengthened for the future because the bank secrecy, as we have known it for the last 40 years, that's done. Banking secrecy, bank secrecy for tax fraud and tax evasion reasons, that's done. There's a big change uh, which has happened to Swiss banking is uh, transparency. Oswald Grubel is the former CEO of Credit Suisse and UBS. He says it is not the financial crisis or tax deals that are putting the most pressure on Swiss banks. It's transparency. We have created a transparency, which we, I think the world public cannot handle, actually. And we are frightened about the transparency because what we hear is, like, oh, we didn't think that. And transparency replaces secrecy and trust. And I think if you would ask every banking client, do you actually want totally transparency from your bank? He would say no, because total transparency means then as well that one day the client will be total transparent. There were moves 30 years ago to stem money laundering, for example, through Swiss banks. But the reputation has stuck that, especially outside of Switzerland, people hear Swiss bank and it's a dirty word. Uh, do you think it's unfair? I think it's unfair, but that is some kind of legend building. And you can uh, watch uh, old Hollywood films of 30, 40 years and uh, where this secret Swiss bank account was mentioned. And uh, so you get that kind of image. In a way, it uh, probably also has helped in times of stress uh, to convince people that to bring some money to Switzerland uh, to a safe place is, is a good thing which has proven to be correct. Switzerland is trying to clean up that image from Hollywood or anywhere else by devoting itself politically to a Weissgeld strategy or clean money strategy. Mario Tour is spokesman for the State Secretariat for International Financial Matters, and he says a political shift came in 2009 when Switzerland adopted standards from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD, on allowing data requests in tax matters. 
This was a change that we said we don't want to have undeclared money in Switzerland and we do not tolerate that the Swiss banking secrecy is, is abused or misused for, for hiding undeclared money. So we have to take some measures that it makes clear that we are the best place for the management, uh, wealth management of declared money. To this end, Switzerland has pushed for tax agreements with Germany, Austria, and the U.K. meant to offer a withholding tax on foreign clients of Swiss banks in exchange for maintaining client anonymity. Now, I think Switzerland is not a tax haven, depend, depending on, on, on what you call a tax haven, of course. Pascal Santamont is director for tax at the OECD. Switzerland has been, uh, for decades, a, a strict bank secrecy state, meaning that uh, when you had a bank account in Switzerland, except for criminal activities, the secrecy was protected. It's no longer the case. It's been changed uh, a few years ago. The Swiss government has passed uh, tax treaties as well as domestic changes in the legislation to allow for exchange of information. So Switzerland was a strict bank secrecy state. It's no longer the case. saint Amand says there has been much progress in Switzerland's compliance with international standards navigating a legacy of secrecy, but there is still a tension outside of Switzerland and even inside caused by the fact the Swiss are maintaining secrecy at all. They haven't yet deserved to lose the public impression around the world that Swiss banking secrecy remains a problem, and that public impression remains broadly correct. We've still got a long way to go. John Christensen is with the London-based activist group Tax Justice Network. The thing about transparency, of course, is that transparency keeps improving until the point where you can see nothing at all. That's the famous joke, but it's a work in progress. I think it's fair to say that we're seeing a strengthening of transparency on bank account secrecy. That's well and good, but what we're not seeing is improvements of transparency in other areas, particularly offshore companies and offshore trusts and offshore fiduciary reasons. That's the next big step, because otherwise simply tackling bank secrecy will lead to uh, a trend towards much, much more complex secrecy structures involving offshore trusts and offshore companies. Christensen box at some claims made by analysts and pundits to point a finger away from Switzerland to other countries, saying they don't have their own house in order when it comes to tax havens. Some U.S. states, for example, have incredibly easy processes to create shell corporations abroad. Christensen says instead of pointing fingers, though, he would like to see proactive measures. Oh, there's no question about it. There's no doubt in my mind that uh, Delaware, <laughs> Wyoming, Nevada, Florida, all of these are, are, are terrible problems. It's good to recognize it, and I think it's important that these things are, are brought out into the public. But rather than say, look, we're not going to change and clear up our act until they've cleaned up their act, what I'd welcome is for Switzerland and the Swiss government to now say, OK, we will commit ourselves to pushing for best practice globally. I feel much happier about Swiss commitment to international cooperation when Switzerland signs up to automatic information exchange on the European Union's model. Is that the threshold for you, then, automatic data exchange? You're not uh, convinced by the Swiss government saying they have a, a vice guild strategy, a clean money strategy now going forward? No, I, I, I'm afraid I'm not convinced at all by that. I think it's yet another ploy to protect banking secrecy. Automatic information exchange is now the recognized global standard. It's the standard that G20 wants to push towards in order to prevent systemic tax evasion and uh, illicit financial flows. Within the next 10 years, it's going to happen. The quicker Switzerland accepts it's going to happen, stops trying to block it from happening, the quicker we'll move forward. Switzerland is moving quicker and stronger in at least one realm of banking reform, and that is the amount of capital or easily liquid assets a bank must hold. The so-called Swiss finish to international banking rules will require banks to hold capital worth an unprecedented 19 percent of risk-weighted assets. Former UBS CEO Oswald Grubel says this is another big change for bankers. If you take higher risk, you need higher, more capital to do that. So that does not allow them to 
speculate as much as in the past anymore. Now, if that is good, uh, only future will prove. I think it will lead to a very long time of uh, no economic growth whatsoever. What do you think um, Swiss banks have to do to remain successful, competitive in the future? I think Swiss banks at first are successful, certainly the big two in comparison with the international, with the other international banks, and they are not less or also not much more successful, but they are successful. What Swiss banks still have, and uh, some other global banks wish they had, is uh, clearly their private banking business. But if you look at uh, the, the biggest bank in private banking, UBS, They have only a fraction of the money really here in Switzerland of the private banking business. Swiss banks, especially the big two, UBS and Credit Suisse, but also private bank Julius Baer, saw the turning tide, says Reiner Skierka, a banking analyst with private bank Zerison in Zurich. He says looking at wealth creation in the last years, old Europe is stagnant and Asia and South America are growing, and Swiss banks were among the first to get to those markets even if regulatory changes mean taking less risk. Well, what would you like more to achieve a 15 to 20 percent return on equity with high risk or 10 to 12 percent with low risk and much more quality and, and insolvency behind you? I think that's the way to go from the capital position point of view. Then the business model has never been based on and will never be based on, on uh, hiding tax evasion money in your own coffers. It's more on quality, on the advantages of the Swiss finance place, the competency of the people, the staff, there are a lot of positive factors which simply will strengthen the, the place. But even if the Swiss financial sector is strengthened, it appears banks look poised to shrink their size, at least in the short term. A recent study from the Back Basel Economic Institute, commissioned by the Swiss Bankers Association, showed the financial sector was set to shrink to just 5.7% of Swiss GDP by 2015, compared to 6.1% last year. It won't reach 6.1% again until 2020. For law professor Peter Kunz, Swiss banks need to keep their heads down to remain successful. Uh, we we have to be quite honest. Most of the times when there is a scandal going it on, a Swiss bank is involved, in particular the big banks. So UBS and Credit Suisse are, in my view, a, a problem for the reputation of Swiss banking. That's, that's very unfortunate because they, they are quite important to, to, to Switzerland. So I think, first of all, we must avoid any scandals. I think we also have to increase uh, the compliance activities in Switzerland. The compliance activities are pretty good already, but probably the standards must be heightened. Of course, this will, will bring the costs skyrocketing high, but be that as it may, we must avoid any scandals. Kunz says Switzerland is often underestimated or mislabeled in its vigilance in legal bank business because of its problems with other countries over taxes, but it was never a dirty money haven. It has long had strict rules on money laundering, and at least on paper, proposed tax deals with other countries are aimed at showing Switzerland of reality is not the Switzerland of legend. John Christensen at the Tax Justice Network says the move to legal, above-board business should be no problem for banks. If they can't be profitable while staying legal, he says they should get out of the business. I think the early movers might be the big winners here because savers are now looking for banks that are not only ethically sound but also banks that are more efficient in the way in which they allocate investment. So I think the banks that move quickly to not only strengthen their ethical reputation but also their practices more generally and their ability to invest profitably, they might be the banks that will shape the markets of the future. But these structural changes in how Swiss banks operate also equate to breaking a covenant with clients. Former UBS CEO Grubel says years ago clients were promised banking secrecy was safe forever, but that is no longer the case. Is uh, Switzerland still the heaven for money in difficult times or in times of uncertainty? That, uh, I think, we will find out 
yeah, in the next big crisis. And if people still trust Switzerland uh, to be safer than any other country or do other countries emerge who have a better image in, in, in that regard. Maybe from the outside, the FinMOS measures look rather harmless as opposed to the large fine imposed by the British FSA. But as a Swiss person, knowing what the um, FINMA has at its disposal, these measures really are somewhat draconic, I have to say. And can you describe uh, what these measures exactly are and what the uh, kind of the strategy of FINMA in, in this case was? Mm. Well, in general, what we can say is that uh, the Swiss have never been fond of large fines as a means to regulate the markets. This uh, kind of a boil them in oil approach, which is typical for Anglo-Saxon regulators, uh, such as the SEC in the US or the British FSA, is alien to Swiss legal culture, as I would say. This is why Swiss law does actually not provide for the FINMA to be able to, to impose fines on banks. What the FINMA may do, it may, for example, um, impose professional bans on individual traders or it may confiscate illicitly acquired gains. Um, but most of the times, the enforcement measures in, imposed by the FINMA are more forward-looking. The Swiss chapter of the Adobe case is certainly not about criminal aspects. They, these have already been dealt with by the South Bank Crown Court in England. What the FINMA has to make clear in this, uh, this case at hand, um, these are the future conditions under which UBS may still perform activities in the investment banking sector. There's been talk already that this would mean uh, higher capital requirements for, for certain aspects of banking, but we're already talking about higher uh, capital requirements as part of the international mm -hmm. rules, the Basel III. So is, are these discussions right now actually related to the Adaboli case, or, or is it part of this larger discussion of, of too big to fail? I wouldn't think so. If we look at the uh, measures imposed by the FINMA, they really directly do relate to the Adobe case. Uh, for example, the FINMA has, um, has instructed the bank not to undertake any significant new business initiatives in its investment banking division unless it has prior approval by the FINMA. That is really rather strict. And even it may not make new acquisitions and uh, needless to say that UBS might find it very difficult to find uh, business partners willing to put up with these really severe circumstances. Secondly, what, what I was really surprised at... Swiss banks have taken on an urban legend kind of persona in the last decades, encouraged by legitimate claims and Hollywood minds alike. Switzerland does not only have the image of being a tax haven, but of course the, the Swiss bank accounts were often used also in Hollywood movies to be the bank accounts of the, of the gangsters or of criminals. Christa Markwalder is a Swiss lawmaker from Bern and sits on the Foreign Affairs Committee. We really have to shift this image to a positive one, saying that we offer good services in the financial sector. Nobody actually has an interest that persons are able to evade taxes. I also think that there is a quite a different approach of um, tax evasion in the U.S. As in, and in Switzerland. Mark Walder there is referring to the fact tax delinquency is not a criminal offense in Switzerland. You won't go to jail for not paying. You will just have to pay sometime. In the U.S., tax collectors are not so accommodating. But she stresses the Swiss have a rule of law, their own system. But it is a difference of thinking about taxation that perhaps fuels an ongoing conflict between Switzerland and the U.S. on alleged American tax evaders hiding assets in Swiss bank accounts. It's clear that if on the other side there is a 500-pound gorilla and you are a small country, it's clear that the, the small country doesn't dictate the rules. Alfred Mettler is a finance professor at Georgia State University. He is also Swiss. He says the Swiss government's push toward a Weisgeld strategy or a clean money strategy doesn't really matter from the American tax collection point of view. I don't think so. 
But I think that the Weisgeld strategy is a strategically very smart approach for Switzerland. It allows Switzerland to put the past behind and position its financial center in a, you know, in a competitive way in this new world that has emerged. Bank secrecy is a thing of the past, but it seems to me that privacy is still, or even more and more, valuable. The United States is still an economic, diplomatic, and military powerhouse, against which a country like Switzerland can't do much. Even combining forces on tax issues or data exchange issues with the EU could not ward off investigations and pressure from the U.S. But Mettler says the Swiss dealing with the U.S. to tax foreign client assets and Swiss banks, for example, could help. We already see it playing the other way around. The agreement that Switzerland uh, will hopefully eventually reach with the U.S. may also increase the pressure from the European Union to get something along similar lines. But I would not see it the other way around. So Switzerland having the same rules like the European Union that that would help with the U.S.? I I don't think so. U.S. investigators have focused in on Swiss banks allegedly aiding clients to evade taxes spurred by a previous deal with big bank UBS, which led to thousands of client names transmitted from Switzerland. It was a devastating blow to Swiss banking secrecy and may have set a precedent for U.S.-Swiss relations of the present and future. Peter Kunz is a law professor at the University of Bern, and he said this to WRS in August. In my view, Switzerland really made some big mistakes four years ago with the United States. They didn't try to really oppose claims by the USA which were unreasonable. And of course, the USA and the IRS, the Department of Justice and so on, now know they just have to put some pressure on Switzerland and Switzerland gives them more or less what they want. Clearly, there have been some additional tensions over the past four years, but I don't want to focus too much on on those tensions because as valid as they are and as important as they are for Switzerland and for the U.S. of A., I think the ties that bind our nations are very strong. Mark Nedlin is chairman of Republicans Abroad in Zurich. He also works for a large American bank. While taxation, data exchange, banking regulations are all vital issues for Switzerland, Nedlin thinks they only make up a small share of the Swiss-U.S. connection. We are part of the same tradition. We are part of the Judeo-Christian ethic. We are both advanced, very wealthy democracies. We strive towards the same big picture goals. Every relationship has tensions, but what differentiates strong relationships from weak relationships is that in a strong relationship, those disagreements, those differences are resolved in a mutually acceptable and civilized way. And this is, I am confident, I'm fully confident that this is what will continue to happen. Nedlin thinks the bilateral relationship will change for the better under a Romney administration. Swiss lawmaker Krista Markwalder thinks the Swiss have more an affinity to Mr. Obama. But the election may not matter much for Swiss-U.S. relations. Probably it doesn't really matter whether there are the Republicans or the Democrats are in power, but there are issues that are long-term issues and that we have to find solutions.